Welcome, and thank you for joining today for Capstone Updates and the new form NA-1005. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. Please note this presentation is being recorded and all audio connections are muted at this time. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. You're welcome to submit questions throughout today's conference. You may do so by selecting all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Type your question in the box provided and hit enter to send. With that, I'll turn the conference over to your moderator, Ariane Ravenbach. Thank you, Candace. Good afternoon and welcome to our Capstone NA-1005 webinar for federal agencies. This webinar is being produced by the Office of the Chief Records Officer at the National Archives and Records Administration. My name is Arian Ravenbach from our Policy and Program Support Team, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some housekeeping, housekeeping announcement. As was indicated, we are only recording the first half of the meeting containing the presentations. We will be sharing both that recording and the PowerPoint presentation slides after the meeting. Please give us a couple of days to post everything to our website and our blog records express. As a reminder, you're still able to use the chat feature to send us your questions ahead of the time we open the meeting for questions. With those announcements out of the way, I would like to turn the meet the program over to Margaret Hawkins, Director of Records Management Operations to open the meeting. Good afternoon, Maggie. Thank you, Arian. I want to welcome you all today to today's webinar on Capstone News. As Arian mentioned, my name is Maggie Hawkins, Director of Records Management Operations in Agency Services, where I oversee the units responsible for record scheduling and appraisal, including the general record schedule team. The teams in my unit work closely with the records management policy and outreach teams within agency services, collaborated on multiple guidance products, including those related to Capstone that we will discuss today. As you already know, there is much interest in email management, electronic messages management, and the capstone approach. We have seen lots of activity this month related to new capstone related products and requirements. And all of you should have received NARA communications in the last month related to these activities. So this webinar is designed to brief you all on the new capstone news, uh, specifically related to the multiple NARA communications that have recently gone out and provide you with the opportunity at the end to ask questions. Next slide. As you can see, we have a really packed agenda today, including uh, starting us off will be Marcus Most, who will be briefing us on the issuance of NARA Bulletin 2023-02, which is the one expanding the use of a role-based role approach capstone for electronic messages. And Marcus will be followed by Andrew Riley, who will be briefing us on the transmittal of the expanded JIRA 6.1, covering email and other electronic messages managed under a capstone approach. Then Sean Curry will be briefing us on the Form NA-1005 resubmission requirements, pursuant to NARA Bulletin 2022-02 and AC Memo 09 2023 And also, Sean will be discussing the changes to the NA-1000 form, and that's the form that's used at the verification for the use of GRS 6.1. And that's gonna be the biggest part of today's webinar is Sean going through the form in a lot of detail so that those of you who are preparing them for submission have a you know, really good chance to uh, look at the form, hear Sean's explanation, and then we'll be able to answer questions as well. And then again, of course, finally, we will conclude with time for questions and answers with all of today's speakers. So before we begin, I'd just like to thank the speakers, Marcus, Andrea, and Sean, as well as Kate Kim, who has supported all the efforts being discussed today, and Arian for being our moderator. Email and electronic messages are likely to remain hot topics in government and thus impact our work greatly. So we hope that today's webinar is of value to you all. And each speaker will introduce themselves at the beginning of their section. So with that, I will turn this over to Marcus Most for the first agenda item. Marcus? 
Okay, thanks, Maggie. Can we go to the next slide, Candace? And one more. Um, my name is Marcus Most. I'm a e records policy uh, in the policy shop here in the records management office. Um, and what we thought we'd do is is kick things off with kind of a view at the high level, which is the bulletin that was issued on January 5th. Um, and really, it uh, it's just expanding and building on the work that we had already done back in 2013 uh, when Capstone was originally introduced. Um, and really, what we're trying to do is to open uh, Capstone up to cover uh, electronic messages writ large. Um, and again, probably no surprise, but reaffirming that electronic messages could be federal records. Let's go to the next slide. Thought we would uh, close this little portion with kind of a picture, which is that. Oh, okay. I'll uh, bring the microphone in closer and speak louder. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, the the blue box across the top is to show that the policy is kind of the overarching piece that opens the door uh, for Capstone to be extend, expanded to other kinds of uh, electronic messages. Um, but that within that, it highlights three different approaches that ag agencies can take for applying uh, disposition or records management. And so, uh, I'm going to end my piece and kind of hand it over to Andrea, who's going to drill down on uh, option one. Thanks, Andrea. Great. I think you can go to the next slide. So, um, good afternoon. I'm Andrea Riley. I'm the supervisor of the operations research and support team in records management services. We're also known uh, as the GRS team, or we include the GRS team. We're responsible for developing and maintaining the general record schedules. I'm here today to share with you about the expansion of GRS 6.1 to include certain other electronic messages. So next slide, please. Uh, so the expanded GRS was part of GRS Transmittal 33, which we issued on January 11th. JIRA 6.1 is one of the options, as Marcus described, um, that's in the bulletin that agencies have for applying a capstone approach for electronic messages. Um, so it's just one of the options. You can still do agency-specific schedules or traditional records management. Um, it is important to note that the JIRAs only cover certain types of electronic messages, however, and we've um, outlined those certain types here on the slide. Um, in, uh, email system chat messages um, that are managed independently from email, messaging services on mobile devices, so that's text messages basically, or messaging services on third-party applications. Next slide, please. The JIRAS specifically excludes certain types of ex uh, electronic messages at this time, and so we've also listed some of those examples here. Um, electronic messages with social media accounts or direct messaging services, um, video conferencing, so chat messages on video conferencing applications, voicemail, um, messages associated with collaborative platforms, and then messages um, that are um, part of systems that are kind of ancillary to the purposes of the larger system. Um, so I believe an example of that be if you have like a, a web-based uh, help system, if they have a chat feature, that would not be included. Uh, next slide, please. So, one of the things that hasn't changed, the GRS is still, uh, 6.1 is still optional um, for both email and electronic messages. Um, so, it is a choice for agencies to use it. Um, agencies are not required to use it for e-messages. Um, they may choose to use it for email only, so that is an option that um, still that you can um, use it for email only and not for e-messages. Um, how um, if you do use it for GRS, the GRS for e-messages, um, you have to use it for email. Um, so that is kind of one 
one uh, requirement is that you can't use it just for e-messages and not email. So you always have to use it for email. Um, if you choose to use the, use the GRS, you must still submit the NA1000 form to NARA for review. Um, that uh, hasn't changed, and that's why we're going to be going over our new form today. Um, the form will now also document whether you are choosing to use the GRS for other e-messages. So that will be clearly indicated on the form, and we will have a lot more information about that new form coming up. New slide. Next slide, please. We've also anticipated that you'll have a lot of questions about the expanded GRS, so we have updated our FAQs. Um, hopefully you will find the answers to some of your more immediate questions in the FAQs. And you can see here on this slide some of the questions um, that we do cover. Uh, if you can't find an answer you're looking for, however, you can always reach out to the GRS team. Our email address will be provided at the end of the presentation, or you can reach out to your appraiser. Um, they also know how to get in touch with us. Uh, next slide, please. And then just some reminders. If GRS 6.1 doesn't meet your agency's needs um, and you still want to use a capstone approach, you may submit an agency specific schedule. That is still an option. That's that's one of the options covered in the bulletin. Uh, if you use GRS 6.1, however, you may not deviate from its scope. So you, if you're going to use it, you have to use it for all of the types of e-messages that the GRS covers if you create them. Um, you know, and again, please talk to your NAR appraisal archivist or the GRS team if you have any questions. And now I believe I am going to be turning it over to Sean Curry. Next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Curry, and I am the newest member of the operations research and support team, otherwise known as the GRS team at here at NARA. Uh, prior to that, I was an appraisal archivist for uh, appraisal team two, where I primarily worked with foreign affairs agencies, as well as the intelligence community. Uh, most relevant for today, since 2010, I've been involved in pretty much every NARA project that relates to capstone. So the original bulletin, I was uh, involved in that. Uh, the creation of the original GRS, I was involved in that, uh, and I was part of all the projects that developed the new GRS, the bulletin, as well as the NA1005 form. So, as others had mentioned, kind of the bulk of our, our presentation today is really going to focus on not only the resubmission requirement, but the NA1005 form itself. So, you're going to be hearing from me quite a bit today, but we are going to leave plenty of time for those uh, questions that you guys might have. So, next slide, please. So we're going to start off by talking about resubmission. Um, so Bulletin 2022-02 set the requirement that we are um, going to resubmit all capstone forms in a four-year cycle. Now, that bulletin came out a while ago and also set up some other ways that you can resubmit forms, including through an ad hoc method. And that is for those agencies that may have such changes to their form that they do not necessarily want to wait for that four-year cycle to kick in. Now, the bulletin 2022-02 was supplemented very recently with AC Memo 09-2023. Hopefully, all of you had seen that. And that sets our first resubmission cycle ever, which will run from January 31st, 2023 through April 30th, 2023. So we're basically giving agencies three months to resubmit an NA-1005 form in those cases where you already have one approved or in cases where you want to use the GRS 6.1 but never actually had your form approved. So this is our very first formal cycle. Uh, it's going to be kind of a test to see how the process works, especially from a review standpoint, but we are excited to uh, work with you all to make sure that you meet the requirements of this bulletin as well as the AC memo. Next slide, please. So it begs the question, and we talked about this at other events, including Bridge, why do we feel that resubmission is required? Uh, simply put, an agency's form is a snapshot in time. It represents the organization of your agency at the time that the form was uh, filled out and approved. As everyone on this call knows, reorganizations are very common within the federal government. Therefore, that snapshot might become outdated relatively quickly. 
we learned this because when we started to get the initial forms back in 2016, it was only a month or two later that agencies began doing resubmitting on their own because they went through such a reorganization or they identified other deficiencies on their form that required updating. So that led to a lot of questions. You know, agencies were asking us, when is it appropriate to resubmit? Are there some changes that are minor enough that we don't have to resubmit? And all those questions uh, starting in 2016 is what led us to the bulletin basically requiring the government-wide resubmission of these capstone forms. Again, with the idea being a lot of our agencies go through reorganizations and these forms would therefore be outdated relatively quickly. Next slide, please. So that also kind of begs the question, what happens if my agency does not resubmit as required? As we already talked about, it is a requirement for agencies to resubmit. Uh, again, if you have an approved NA-1005 form now, or if you would like to use GRS 6.1, but never had a form um, approved. So what we're gonna be doing is NAR is going to be tracking compliance with the resubmission requirements. Uh, simply put, agencies that do not submit by the deadline, that April 30th date, will be considered non-compliant and will track you accordingly. Uh, NARA will initiate what we're calling an escalation plan. That's simply our way of working with you to get you to compliance. We'll reach out to you, offer help, uh, ask you if there's anything we can do to help you get that form submitted and approved, and really work with you to become compliant. That's our goal, is to keep all of you compliant so that you're protected and that we're managing our email and potentially electronic messages properly. As you're probably already aware, because email management is such a, a topic of interest, not only to members of the public, but Congress, we do have the status of email management for each and every agency on our website. So, you know, if we do get to a point later in the year where we do not get a resubmission, it's quite probable that your agency's status will be changed into that non-compliant status. But I'm very hopeful, especially with those of you that are taking the time to join us today, that you're going to work with us and we're going to work with you to get your forms resubmitted and approved to make sure that everybody is protected and in um, compliance with NAR requirements. So again, we're going to be here to help you, not only on the GRS team, but your individual appraisal archivist, and really work with you to make sure that resubmission goes smoothly. Next slide, please. So as Andrea already mentioned, the Form NA-1005 verification for the use of GRS 6.1 is still a requirement, but it has been revised. And the second part of my presentation is really gonna go into a detailed tour of what that revised form looks like and what types of information we're looking for to make approval of your form smooth. So the new form, it accounts for the expansion of GRS 6.1, specifically the inclusion of certain other types of electronic messages. It also documents the changes made from a previous submission. It documents instances where a position is removed from the organization, but legacy email still needs to be managed as permanent. And when we get into the tour of the form, I'm gonna talk more about that and why that's important. And it's also going to facilitate requests to what we call flip positions from permanent to temporary. Frankly put, when we reviewed the first round of forms beginning in 2016, there's a lot of cases where we approved too many positions. Uh, positions that didn't necessarily fit the GRS 6.1 categories. So the new form is going to facilitate instances where your agency or we at NARA really think that maybe that was a mistake and we want to remove some positions from your form, therefore moving them from permanent to the temporary category. And again, when I get to the tour of the form, it'll make more sense when we get to that section. So again, the NA-1005 form is very, very important in terms of documenting and allowing NARA to have an oversight uh, role in making sure that the GRS 6.1 is being applied correctly and consistently across the federal government. Next slide, please. So I uh, when I developed the next section about the NA-1005, I kind of figured that everyone on this call today is gonna fall into one of these three scenarios. And I tried to design the section to really meet the needs of all these scenarios. So number one, your agency may have only ever used the old, the original PDF version of the form. 
that was retired many years ago and switched over to an Excel version. But we do have many, many agencies that only ever used that PDF form. So switching over to the Excel form, there might be a little bit more of a learning curve and hopefully today's um, webinar and tour will help you guys out. The other scenario is your agency used a previous version of the Excel form. As I said, we moved from PDF to Excel relatively uh, soon after the 2016 launch of Capstone. And there are many agencies that have already submitted previous versions of the Excel form. So the learning curve for you may be a little bit lower where, you know, really pay attention to what has changed from those forms. And I will point that out when we go on our tour. And then finally, the scenario that your agency wants to use GRS 6.1, but has never submitted any version of the form. So maybe everything I'm talking about today might be new to your agency, uh, but again, we're here to help and to hopefully make the process of filling out these forms as smooth and painless, uh, painless as possible. Uh, so again, we are here to support you in this requirement. Next slide, please. So with the resubmission requirement behind us and the understanding that resubmission is required for those agencies who are using GRS 6.1, I want to kind of turn now to the tour of the revised form. And this is where we're gonna spend most of our discussion today, as I literally walk you through some screenshots and talk to you about the types of information that we're looking for when you're filling out these forms. Next slide, please. So first question, where can I find the NA-1005 form? So on our GRS page, and I think most of you are probably comfortable on our GRS page, right under the GRS 6.1, we have a link to the form. Clicking on that will automatically download a blank version of the new Excel form. If you ever have any issues downloading it or finding it, simply let us know or talk to your appraisal archivist and we can email you a copy of the form or really help you get it so you can get things started. Next slide, please. So once you download the form, this is the first page you're going to see. And I want to point out the upper right hand corner where it says revised 12 2022. This means that this is the most current version of the form. Uh, reality is, is that previous versions of our form are floating around out there. And I'm only pointing this out because if you do submit an older version of the form, we are going to reject it and send it back. So it's imperative as you begin doing your resubmission uh, activities that you make sure that you're looking at the 12 2022 version of the form, because again, it has been revised and we're gonna talk about those revisions. The form itself is designed to be, give a lot of instructional information and to hopefully walk you through the process. Next slide, please. So as an Excel spreadsheet, there are, or workbook, I should say, there are lots of tabs at the bottom that are gonna lead you through filling out the form. And you'll see that the very first one where I'm pointing now says general information. Next slide, please. So the general information is very similar to what we collected on the original PDF version. Uh, it's certainly uh, similar to what we collected on earlier versions of the Excel form. And it is just that, general information about your agency and what your plans are when it comes to using the GRS 6.1. So there's lots of questions here. And again, you'll kind of be led through them as you work your way down on the sheet. And I'm gonna show you some examples of some of the questions now. Next slide, please. So when we switched over from the PDF version of the form to Excel, we tried to utilize drop-down menus whenever it seemed appropriate. And this also helped us with getting consistent uh, answers or responses across the federal government. Some of them are very simple yes or no questions, like the example in front of you. Is there a classified version of this schedule, meaning the NA-1005 form? Simple yes or no, most of you will answer no to that. So again, we tried our best to really make it easier for you to fill these forms out by giving you the drop-down options when it was appropriate. Next slide, please. So I really wanna highlight line number 16. This is the biggest change to the form related to the expansion of GRS 6.1. And this is literally where you are documenting whether or not you will be applying the GRS to those other types of electronic messages that are included in the scope. As Andrea already mentioned, if you use 6.1, you have to use it for email, 
but you don't necessarily have to use it for the other kinds of electronic messages. A lot of agencies may not be ready for that just yet. Your comfort level might be that you still only want this to apply to email, and that is perfectly acceptable. And line 16 is where you document that. If you answer yes, it means you are applying the GRS to the other types of electronic messages. If you answer no, that means you're just using it for email, just like perhaps you did before the GRS was expanded. So this is a very, very important question. Uh, obviously, it's one of the answers that we need you to complete, and it will help us do our review of the form and lead to other information we collect. Next slide, please. So moving our way down, we're gonna again, get to more and more questions about the general way that you are implementing Capstone and using the GRS 6.1. Not everything is a drop down menu. And an example of that is the additional scope comments uh, line number 20, where it's literally an open field. If there's something you want us to know about how you're implementing, how you're using Capstone, this is where you'll put that information. For example, if you're limiting it to a specific office or a specific email system, or if you anticipate uh, submitting other forms for your agency, this is really the background information, a little summary of what you think we need to know about your use of the GRS 6.1. Next slide, please. So again, as we move our way down, we get to line number 22, cutoff instruction. Now, this is another dropdown where hopefully it's gonna make it easier for you to complete the form, but this is literally where you're telling us how you would like to cut off the email or electronic messages that you are managing. And you'll see the options we have there are the typical ones that all agencies were already using. Cut off at the end of the calendar year, cut off at the end of the fiscal year, employee tenure, current administration, or if you think of a cutoff that we didn't think of, you can select other, and then when we do the review of the form, we'll have a chat with you about exactly what you're proposing. The GRS 6.1 was approved in such a way to kind of give agencies the flexibility to, divide, to define their own cutoff and transfer instructions within certain parameters. So this question on cutoff instruction is one of those where we're empowering you to decide which method of cutoff is appropriate for your agency. And a lot of agencies are now using employee tenure, which means that literally you're gonna wait until that capstone official leaves office and that is when the disposition clock is going to start. So this is one of the many decisions an agency needs to make as they're filling out their form and designing their capstone implementation plan. Next slide, please. Whenever we have cutoff, that brings us to transfer. This relates to item number 10, those accounts that are approved as permanent. Now, what we're saying here is, is that you have the option to transfer these records anywhere between 15 and 30 years after cutoff. That lines up with the Federal Records Act and again gives you the flexibility. The other thing the transfer instruction does is it allows you to, um, to basically split out your classified email from unclassified email if that applies to your agency. So for example, 15 years or after D-class review means that if you have unclassified email, you can send it to us at 15 years after cutoff. But if you have classified email, you can transfer it to us after the mandatory declassification review, which is usually at 25 years. This is just our way of documenting again that you have classified email, but also allowing the declassification uh, executive order requirements to still apply. Now, one of the negatives of Excel is we had to truncate these answers, which is why in our instructions, we kind of write out what one of these would actually mean. And we're using the first one as the example where unclassified email comes to us at 15 years after cutoff, but classified email at 25 years after that mandatory declassification review occurred. If you're one of the many, many agencies that does not have classified email, whatever you pick is gonna be when all the email comes to us, 15, 20, 25, or 30. You'll also see that we have the options for what is known as five-year blocking. So instead of doing a transfer every year, which might be burdensome for an agency, you can say, I'm gonna hold off and just do a transfer every five years. A lot of you have used that language for non-email record schedules. It's the same concept. But if you have any questions or you need help determining which of these is the appropriate um, plan for your agency, reach out to your appraisal archivist or, or those of us on the GRS team, 
and we can have that conversation with you. Next slide, please. So I wanna point out something that is brand new to the Excel form, and that is a tab, and you'll see the arrow pointing to it called electronic messages. Now, if you answered yes on line number 16, meaning that you are applying this GRS to other types of electronic messages, this tab becomes mandatory. It's a requirement. If you answered no, because you're only applying it to email, you can skip this tab. Next slide, please. This tab is just collecting some very high level information about what is the universe of electronic messages that you have within your agency. And I'm gonna walk you through, since this is going to be new to pretty much everybody who's on this call today. Next slide, please. You'll see it's starting with lines five, six, and seven. These are verbatim from the GRS 6.1 itself. It is the three types of electronic messages that are included within the scope of GRS 6.1. We are literally just asking you yes or no about whether or not you are creating these types of records within your agency. So even if only a small percentage of the positions listed on your form are creating this type of record, your answer is yes. And to reiterate what Andrea said, if you are using the GRS 6.1 for the other types of electronic messages, and you're creating all of these types of electronic messages, you must apply it to all of them. For example, if you are using a third party application like WhatsApp, you can't answer no there and not use the GRS 6.1. You have to apply it to all three types of records that you are creating within your agency. And if you need help understanding that or more help about what is appropriate, uh, what are the appropriate answers for your agency, definitely touch base with us and we could walk you through this. Next slide, please. The final portion of this tab, you know, it's only three yes or no questions. And then we have a required open text field. This is where we just want you to give us a little summary about what does the universe of electronic messages look like in your agency. And you can see the example we have here. All the positions represented in categories one through six are creating chat and text messages affiliated with our email system. Only those in categories one and two are using third party application, WhatsApp. Most officials have personal devices, phones, and are creating electronic messages on those devices. Again, very high level summary, just letting us know what the universe of electronic messages looks like in your agency. As I mentioned earlier, this is the very first time we're using this form. It's the very first time that resubmission has kicked in. So what a good response looks like here is still kind of up in the air, but we will work with you when we get the form to come up with a statement that gives us the information we need, but also accurately reflects the universe of electronic messages within your agency. So again, if you answered yes for line 16 and the general information tab, these three questions and this one open text field are required to be completed for your form. And again, we are here to help you with all of these as you move forward. If you answer no, because you're using the GRS 6.1 for email only, Again, maybe you're not ready to expand it just yet. You get to skip this tab completely. We don't want a response to it in that case. Next slide, please. So now is when we start getting into the different categories. Those of you that are more familiar with the GRS 6.1 know that it is broken down for item number 10. That is the permanent accounts, permanent email. It is broken down into 10 different categories. Those 10 categories were designed so that we can be consistent across the federal government in terms of what positions we are declaring to have permanent email. The revised GRS 6.1 that just came out the other week did not change these categories at all. The category definitions have remained the same. So if you're only using the GRS for email, you probably already have some good uh, experience with this. But if you're also using it for the other types of electronic messages, all the positions that you're listing in these 10 categories, you now need to manage those three types of messages as permanent records, just like email. So the category tabs literally allow us to walk through and for you to propose what positions, what roles within your agency fit the definition. And let's go over a few examples of that. Next slide, please. So this is what category one looks like. 
What we did up on the top is we copied over verbatim the definition of the category from the GRS. This way you'll have that definition in front of you as you are creating this form. The biggest change compared to the PDF version is that each category is now broken down into three different sections to facilitate how you are presenting information to us. And I'm gonna walk you through why we have those three different sections and what we expect you to have there. But first, a little bit on logistics. Next slide, please. So when you load up this form, the default is, is that every category has enough space for you to list 10 positions. For a lot of categories, including category one, that is plenty of space, right? For other categories, like maybe category six or seven, you may have the need for, addition, for, for more than 10 um, lines. The add row function is just that. It's a macro designed, it's built into the form where you click on that and you can add additional rows where you need them to be. Next slide, please. You'll see when you click on that, it'll literally ask you a question. Enter the row number where you want to add a row. In this case, I'm gonna pretend that I want it to be after row number nine. Next slide, please. After I do that, it's gonna say, well, how many rows would you like to input? In this particular example, I'm gonna say, I would like an additional 10 rows. Hit the okay. Next slide. I now have 20 rows instead of 10. Now, for those of you that are maybe a little more savvy with Excel, the other ways of adding and deleting rows, like any other Excel worksheet, are still available to you. So if you don't wanna use the add row function, you can still do your right click on the left, do your insert or delete, just like you would for any Excel spreadsheet. But we wanted to build the macro in for those of you that might not be as aware about Excel and maybe wanted an easier way to do it. But I did wanna point out that there's other ways to do an insert and delete of rows, just like you would for any other Excel spreadsheet. The Excel spreadsheet we use for the 1005 is really like any other product you've used in Excel where you can add and delete multiple ways. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about, you know, the three sections within each category. The first, which is kind of, you know, little subsection A, are the active permanent positions, day forward and legacy. This is gonna be the majority of your positions for any category. Those that you believe fit the description of the category and still exist within your organization. One of the big changes we made to the form is what I have circled here, which is a summary of changes from a previous submission. This is where you're going to tell us what is different from the last form that we reviewed at the National Archives. It's to really facilitate review on our side. You'll see on the bottom, we have not applicable. That would be, for example, if this is your very first submission ever. It's not a resubmission for you because you've never submitted a form before. Otherwise, we're asking you to choose one of them on this list, which could be, for a lot of them, no change at all. The Archivist of the United States, which is the example we have here, that's exactly how the position was listed on the previous form. Therefore, it's no change. We developed this list from conversations we had with agencies who resubmitted prior to resubmission even being a requirement. And it kind of documents all the types of changes we saw out there, from a title change to the number of accounts or positions going up or going down, or it could be a completely new position that didn't exist in your organization for the last submission, or it could be a change in category designation. That's for cases where you might have, say, put something in category three, but now that we've been using this for a while, you're like, you know what, that actually belongs in category number one, it's a way just to document that we're moving positions around to different categories. And then we also have reappraised as permanent, including legacy. That is for those positions that always existed in your agency, but maybe we forgot them in our first form or we overlooked it. So again, I'm hoping that these are relatively self-explanatory, but we can help you. And as we go through review, we'll ask questions, but I think for the majority of agencies, you're likely gonna see a lot of no change when you start filling out your resubmission. Next slide, please. So this is a completed example. We have Archivist of the United States. Also different from the original PDF form is we have number of positions versus number of accounts. That is to allow us to know, in this case, 
even though there is only one archivist in the United States, that position has three different email accounts. And we're saying there was no change from the previous submission. I do want to point out that the categories are still only about email. If you are using this also for the other types of electronic messages, we don't expect you at this point to be able to say, okay, number of accounts is 30 because the archivist is using two different phones. They're using WhatsApp. They're using this. That information will need to be collected at the time of transfer via documentation. But on the form, we're looking for a rough idea to give us an idea of how much email to expect when it is time for legal transfer to the National Archives. So again, in this example, one position, three accounts. In the old original PDF version, we basically only had number of accounts, which gave us kind of a false sense. It gave us a, like a high number of accounts, which didn't necessarily equate to the number of positions. This allows us to break them apart from each other so we can tell how many positions within an agency are being captured as permanent, but also the total number of accounts. Next slide, please. We still encourage you and we still allow to do what we call rolling up of like positions. In this example, we have an agency where the head of the agency is a board. So we're saying we have eight board members. We don't expect you to put eight different entries there for positions that are essentially the same. For example, you don't have to say board member number one, board member number two. So in this particular example, we're saying we have eight different board members. Between the eight of them, they have 16 accounts because in this example, let's pretend that each of them have two email addresses. And just for fun, we're saying that the number of accounts positions has increased since the previous submission. This might have been an example of where early on there was only six board members, but something in the organization changed. Now we have eight. The form is documenting that change from the previous submission. So again, we're hoping it's relatively self-explanatory when filling this out, but if not, we are definitely here to help you along the way, especially for those of you that may have never had experience with any of these forms before. Next slide, please. So moving our way down, we get to subsection B within category one. These are permanent legacy records only. This was born over a reality that we discovered very quickly after the 2016 forms started to come in. This deals with those positions that existed within your organization, clearly matched the category definition, so their email is permanent, but the position was since completely removed from your organization. This seems to happen quite often where during an organization, uh, reorganization, a position, one that's high up and had permanent email, was literally done away with. What's important about this, though, is that the legacy email, the existing email, is still permanent. And this allows us to document that. So we're basically saying, I had this position in my organization. It fit the category. They created a lot of permanent email in this category but the position went away at a certain point. This is a reminder that that legacy, that existing email, still needs to be managed as permanent until all of it is transferred to the National Archives. Next slide, please. So just like with subsection A, we tried to make it easier by giving a drop-down menu. The majority of these will fall into that very first option, position removed from the organization and legacy email remains permanent. Some of the other ones we put in there, I don't think we're going to see that actually happen, where the duties, for example, changed from meeting uh, from matching the category to not matching the category. We wanted to have other options there for you. But the vast majority of uh, agencies we worked with in this scenario have fallen into that first one, where a position is completely removed, but they still have that legacy email that needs to be managed as permanent. Next slide, please. So here's an example of one that has been filled out. We're gonna pretend that it's the deputy public affairs director. It existed in the organization, but was done away with. They had one position, two accounts. The position was removed from the organization. And we're saying that it, that happened in calendar year 2020. That just allows us to know that at a certain point, we're gonna get all that legacy email and this position can be removed from the form and we no longer have to worry about tracking it. Again, the whole idea here is is to number one, reaffirm that you have responsibility to manage that legacy email, but also allows us at NARA to know what to expect and when. 
And again, any confusion about this section, let us know and we'll help walk you through it. But I do believe a lot of you will hit this where you realize that a position that was included as permanent in your first submission now no longer exists within your organization, but they still have a legacy email that needs to be managed. This section will document that. Next slide, please. So finally, we get to subsection C. We're calling this the removed positions. This is the flip I mentioned before, where maybe on an original submission, you included positions that maybe did not really meet the definition of the category. To be frank, I think we did have a little bit of overkill with some agencies where we agreed to include positions that were a little iffy about whether or not they belonged in that category. This allows us to basically remove them from the list of permanent accounts. So all of their email will now be temporary because we're all agreeing after approval of the form that this position even though it was on a previous approved form, actually does not match the category description. Next slide, please. And you'll see the example I have here just made up, Assistant Deputy Director, Office of Consumer Affairs. You're proposing that be removed because you're saying that no longer or never really did match the category description. You'll notice that we are not collecting information about number of accounts or number of positions because we only really are concerned about those that are eventually going to be transferred to us at the National Archives. So that's why we don't have those numbers here. We just wanna know that this position was permanent on a previous form, but we're all agreeing that we're removing it because it never should have been included in the first place. So there is potential that a lot of you who are resubmitting will find um, positions that you don't think really match that category definition. This is your opportunity to propose having them removed and we at the National Archives during review will work with you to see whether or not that is appropriate. So again, the biggest change within each category is that what used to be just one long list of positions for each category is now broken up a little bit. The majority of yours will likely fall into that top list of active permanent positions, but you may have a few uh, occurrences of those that are appropriate for either B or C, because you have positions that went away, or your proposing position should never have been approved as permanent, and we're documenting it on the form. Next slide, please. Uh, before I go into totals, I, I obviously just kind of stayed within category one, but all 10 categories have their own tab. All of them are identical, except of course, the category definition, which is at the top, is carried over directly from the GRS 6.1. So once you start filling out one category, it will likely go quicker as you work your way through and start utilizing some of the drop down menus and reviewing the positions on an a, a earlier form compared to what you're proposing here. I do want to point out we do have a tab for totals. Next slide. What this does is it does the math for us. When we were in each category tab, it was adding up the number of positions and number of accounts for that category. The Excel uh, uh, workbook is designed to automatically bring those numbers up to the total tab so that if somebody within your agency or somebody within the National Archives wants to know how many positions within your agency are, are permanent, how many accounts it is, we can just come to this tab without having to go through all 10 and without having to do the math. It's just a way for us to be able to have that information quickly at our fingertips and I think is also of interest to members of the public, Congress, public interest groups, who are very curious about email management within the federal government. So just wanted to point that out, that we don't require you to do math. The workbook will do that for us. Next slide, please. So one thing I really want to reiterate before we get into all the questions you've been asking is we really want you to reach out to us. We have the GRS team uh, mailbox that you see here. We're always happy to answer questions. Also reach out to your appraisal archivist. They have gone through similar webinars like this and can also assist you with filling out the forms. I also really wanna reiterate the importance of looking at the FAQs for GRS 6.1. They are indeed frequently asked questions, ones that we've been getting from a lot of agencies. And I think reviewing that document before attempting to fill out the form will really help you. If not, as Andrea said, as Marcus said, reach out to us. You can also write to me directly at sean.curry at nara.gov 
and we'd be very, very happy to help you. So with that, I wanna return it to Candice just for a logistical change, and then we'll head over to the question period. Thanks to the presenters and to all of you for joining us today.